Gordon Ripshawby. I'm a livestock research officer with New South Wales DPI. Uh, I'm based at the Cowra Research Station. My area of expertise uh, is in the reproduction field. Uh, and I've come to this issue of grazing cereals from the perspective of you health. I've got a handout because uh, I like people to go away with some take home messages and they're going to be put down. So if you can just pass those around. I think I've got enough for everybody. I've got some spares. One of the key things in there on one of those pages, there's two sides. I've got a table uh, in there and on that table you can from that table you can use uh, the formula in there to calculate feed quality values on the mineral content of your forage if you're testing it. And that's uh, quite an important take home message. So grazing cereals, the title of my presentation is grazing cereals with demand in sheep. And what that means is that uh, I'm not really talking about dual purpose crops in the sense that I'm not talking about uh, forage, brassicas. I'm talking about grazing cereals. So it's wheat, triticale, oats and barley. Now they have uh, very high quality feed values and they fit mixed farming systems and particularly high rainfall zones really neatly, but they also have mineral imbalances. And they're particularly with wheat and triticale uh, and oats have a big role in that as well. So the other part of the title is demanding sheep. Demanding sheep are animals that have a high requirement for mineral intake. And an animal that has a high demand for these minerals is an animal that's growing, growing rapidly, an animal that's growing fast and has a higher demand, an animal that has a higher mature weight will have a higher demand for minerals as it's growing, uh, and an animal later in its uh, gestation, so twin bearing years particularly. It's probably about a million hectares of grazing cereals sown around Australia annually now, at least. It's not very well documented, uh, but we know it's rapidly adopted across all of the mixed farming zones and high rainfall zones. The real value in the grazing cereal is that it provides you with uh, winter feed gap. That, and that's why it's really very suitable for the high rainfall zones particularly. So it fills a winter feed gap, it provides livestock with rapidly, easily digestible feed that's most of the time very high quality protein, very high quality energy, uh, good fibre, good digestibility, good uh, water soluble carbohydrates. So most of the time, uh, or almost all of always, livestock are going to grow on grazing cereals. About 40% of the total benefit you get from grazing cereals is actually found in the rest that's afforded to the pastures. So when your livestock are in the grazing cereals, your pastures are getting a break, and on the whole farm, in the context of a whole farm, that's about 40% of the benefit of having a grazing cereal integrated in your system. But they've got whiskers, and, and the whiskers are around the balance of minerals. There's quite a lot of potassium in grazing cereals, and that causes problems with the balance of sodium, uh, and it interferes with the absorption of calcium and magnesium through the gut. One of the most important things with grazing cereals is knowing when to stop grazing, uh, and I'm quite sure you'll all be up to speed with that sort of stuff. So, jointing or first hollow stem or Zadox stage Z31 is the time when you want to be taking livestock out of the cereals because grazing beyond that point most of the time is going to cause a yield penalty. There won't be any yield penalty if you remove livestock at Z31. In fact, if you leave more biomass or more leaves, more dry matter in the crop at Z31, the better will be your grain recovery. So it's a neat fit. Uh, there are some, uh, there are some sort of seasonal influences around there. So if you have, if you expect uh, good spring rains, uh, you can graze a little heavier or a little longer past Z31. If you're going to have a shorter season, you stop before then. The more biomass you leave at that stage, the better the grain recovery, and that's the key point. So the whiskers. We've got mineral imbalances that we already know about in grazing cereals. And most of the research that's been undertaken in the last 10 years has been looking at growth rate of lambs. Not a lot of research has been looking at the health of those animals. So you'll be familiar with the idea of providing salt and cosmag and lime for livestock. Um, some people don't do it at all. 
and sometimes you get away with that. Sometimes you do provide these minerals and you still have livestock problems. I think the basic rule of thumb for me is if you're using grazing cereals for any class of livestock and you're not providing minerals, you should be budgeting for livestock health problems. Question is around growth rate. So lambs. Uh, twin lambs in one study were shown to be 6% uh, heavier, uh, I think, at marking. It's only one study. In weaners, most of the studies show that you get 20 to 60 percent improvement in growth rate. 60 percent is absolutely stunning. It's huge. All these lambs are growing anyway. When we provide magnesium in the form of cause mags and magnesium oxide and salt, we can get anywhere between 20 and 60 percent. You would budget on 20 percent. So if you're using grazing cereals and you're not using salts with those, um, it's 20% you're not getting. And it's really about feed conversion efficiency. There might be an improvement with magnesium. Magnesium is, uh, has a role of about 300 metabolic uh, interactions in the body. So it's a particularly important uh, mineral, but it's not known to be a growth stimulant mineral. Use those. This is one of the real problems. When you do surveys of producers, they show that there's problems with what they call grass tetany, pre-tox, milk fever, prolapse, rickets, lameness, dystopia. These are all diseases commonly associated by farmers with grazing cereals. When we run our research trials looking at new health status on those grazing cereals, we tend not to find a lot of dead sheep. So there's some interesting questions around that. Is it how we are we managing these animals when they're going on of the cereals and they're coming off the cereals, or is it just the cereals, or are there other factors inside of that? So the producer surveys show these. When you talk to district veterinarians, most of the time they go out to milk fever cases on grazing cereals. So milk fever is the primary the primary disease, in, in, insofar as I'm concerned. And that means it's hypercalcemia, hyper means low, so it's low blood calcium levels. Calcium is managed by the parathyroid hormone. Thyroid's little glands around in your neck. The parathyroid is tissue around the thyroid gland. The parathyroid hormone uh, stimulates the management, uh, which is called homeostasis of calcium in the blood. And it does that through a series of interactions. So parathyroid hormone will increase when it detects there's low calcium in the blood. That will stimulate the conversion of vitamin D2 to vitamin D3. So the body has to have uh, exposure to sunlight, because that stimulates the conversion. And it has to have functioning kidneys to find, finalize that last step. That's calcium. So I've just written this up. I don't find this in any of the literature really talking about it, but that's like a formula for the risk status of uh, metabolic diseases around this grazing cereal. So we have demand. Demand is how much mineral does an animal need in a kilogram of dry feed? And that will vary. And it varies by growth rate. So if you've got a lamb growing at 100 grams or a lamb growing at 200 grams, the lamb at 200 grams needs to eat more calcium. So they have to have a better quality source of calcium inside their forage than a lamb at 100 grams. If both lambs are growing 200 grams a day, one will turn out to be a 50 kilo sheep, one will turn out to be a 60 kilo sheep. 60 kilo sheep, even at 200 grams, still need more minerals. We've got influences with age, you've got physiological status. So twin bearing ewes need more minerals than single bearing ewes and they need most of these minerals late in pregnancy and in early lactation. So demand. Then there's forage intake. So of course, like a pipe uh, carrying water, the intake is really about how much forage they actually eat. They're eating half a kilo a day, one kilogram, two kilograms a day. Then there's the availability in the forage. So it's not just content, so what's in the forage, it's also how available it is. And that can be a function of the balance of other minerals inside the forage itself. So the grazing cereals are rich in potassium. And potassium tends to push away magnesium and calcium. So you'll find that in high potassium soils, the content of calcium and magnesium in the forage will be lower. And so too will sodium. 
So we get mineral imbalances inside our forage. Then we get differences in absorption. Young animals are better at extracting calcium, for example, out of the gut than our older animals. Mineral imbalances can also affect the rate of absorption. So if there's too much potassium, not enough sodium, you won't absorb magnesium very well. Too much potassium and calcium, the absorption of calcium is also impaired. So we have a number of issues all converging into one in grazing cereals. And then there's stress, and that's the other variable we're not really picking up very well in the research trials at the moment. And that's because stress involves having animals say on grazing cereals for several weeks, and you put the dogs behind them, push them into the yards, and drench them, crush them, hold them off feed for a while. You add a lot of stresses, and you reduce intake, and that's when maybe we're starting to see these metabolic diseases turn up. There was a producer of Yas who had uh, sheep on, I think 300 sheep or so on uh, a grazing cereal, and he had those used with, uh, with minerals. Minerals were available, and those sheep were in minerals. He took them off that cotton, put them, off, put them onto a clover rich pasture. He said, Well, that'll be fine, there's lots of calcium in clover. He came out the next day and he lost, I think, 30%. Variation in intake, followed by the stress. And then there's some additional caveats around that. So the maturity of the plant, which might be a function of the depth of the roots, can also change the concentration of these minerals in the forage. So it, it's most likely that young cereals are more risky than more mature cereals. Soil temperature can do things with the relationship with magnesium uh, content in the soil and also the concentration of potassium around the roots. So under, under colder conditions, we might be getting a greater proportion of potassium being absorbed relative to magnesium. Uh, I've talked about the variation in demand within individuals, uh, and there's, there's some other relationships. I've talked about soil potassium, but even the pH of the soil, the concentration of aluminium, might influence uh, how readily absorbed uh, some of these other minerals are. So there's a whole number of chemical interactions in this area. The main player is potassium. Now, potassium is a good cop, but he's also a bad cop. He's a Jekyll and Hyde. In the plant, potassium's primary role is around the management of water. And in potassium deficient soils, plants don't grow very well at all. NPKs are the primary macronutrients driving plant production. And so potassium is extremely important for forage growth. As you increase the concentration of potassium in a feed, you get better energy out of the feed as well. More fibre, better digestibility of that fibre. So it's a good cop and a bad cop. It really depends about the content, how much is there. And it's also in relation to how much sodium have you got. And if these two are out of whack, we start to affect the absorption of magnesium. And too much potassium lowers calcium absorption. There's a couple of other players. So if you're aware of the debate around providing minerals for livestock or grazing cereals. Some people are starting to talk about DCAD, and I'll introduce that in a minute, and that relies on sulfur and chloride concentrations. Basically, this is the relationship. When we get a lot of K, we don't get a lot of these ones. Or we don't get a lot of absorption of those ones. One of the key ratios is the K and A ratio, the ratio of potassium to sodium. When that's too high, the absorption of magnesium is reduced greatly. Now the primary ratio is very important to the dairy industry, so a lot of this work we understand around these minerals comes out of the cattle industry and the dairy industry. The Tetany index is a ratio of potassium to calcium plus magnesium. A very new ratio which has been hypothesized in the literature just in the last 12 months is the ratio of potassium to sodium plus magnesium. One of the interesting questions we're starting to look at these other different ratios now is because we're getting livestock that aren't growing when you provide them with salt. So you go back a couple of slides and you remember I had animals growing, weaners growing 20 to 60 kilo, uh, 20 to 60 percent better, but sometimes zero. So when we try to correct this ratio by providing sodium, or if we try to fix the deficiencies we're getting in magnesium by providing cause mag and salt. And we're still not getting growth rates, and there's other things we need to understand. So we're starting to look at these ratios as well. And then there's the DCAD. Now the DCAD is a dietary cation anion difference. 
it's about the metabolic, it's about the, uh, the weight of the minerals, essentially in the feed. Lots of potassium and sodium, not a lot of sulfur and chloride, and that's characteristic of the grazing cereals. We get a very high ratio, a very big number. That changes the pH in the animal. When we start to change the pH, we lower blood counts. We also impair the ability of vitamin D3 to complete uh, its conversion into its most bioactive form of regulating calcium in the body. So vitamin D3 is very good at improving the efficiency of extraction of calcium out of the gut, and if it's not able to get enough, it'll turn to the bones. Vitamin D3 is a pro-hormone that stimulates other hormones which do that work. So if our DK is really high, with a big number here, we increase rumen urine pH and we decrease blood calcium. So that's a risk from hypercalcemia that's been demonstrated really clearly in goats and sheep, uh, goats and cattle, and not so clearly in sheep. The relationship of changing the pH of the animal with the calcium is quite clear. We know that in sheep, if we give them a really low decal diet, so we change this ratio around really heavily, and give them an acidic diet, hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen chloride, uh, the metabolic compounds that drive the acidity here, we can increase blood calcium. But by how much? Now if we stress the animals, do we get the response we need in goats? The answer is yes. In cattle, the answer is yes. In sheep, the answer is we're not too sure. We don't think so. I'm not convinced necessarily that's a big driver of it yet. But really what it says is some people are going to advocate strongly for anionic diet.